Thanks so much. It's really exciting to see so many friends here in the audience. Thanks. Um, I am presenting this work on behalf of my fabulous colleagues and I, so Brock Craft here in the front, um, Samantha Shorey, who couldn't be here, fabulous PhD student at UW, and um, Helen Remick, who you'll meet soon. So today, I want to explore the simple question of what innovation looks like when we take a kind of wider historical perspective. So HCI's typical cases of hardware to development are, are focused on these kind of cutting edge tools, systems, infrastructures. But these, these sites of collective digital manufacturing have a much longer history that reveal deeper insights about how the innovation of things unfolds. So what I want to share with you today is a kind of story, a, a critical fabulation, if you will, that, that popular discourse often elides when it, it tends to valorize the work of individuals. Now in the 2008 documentary miniseries Moon Machines, you see two women in these sort of white lab coats, rolled up sleeves, passing a needle through a grid back and forth. The grid has these metal eyelet holes between it. And to many, this process could really resemble acts of weaving, right? Lacing threads in orthogonal directions to create a kind of textile form. But here, the weavers are using sort of unusual materials. They have these magnetic rings. They have kind of an, a wire and an odd-shaped loom with long and narrow desks with two rectangular spaces cut in. And the women appear to be almost low-wage laborers working within a factory setting, not side by side. Now, over this scene broadcast the voice of a managing director named Richard Batten. He says, we call this the LOL method, the little old lady method of wiring these cores. Not a very nice, he says. Now this footage, which is of just a few seconds long, if not for the voice of Richard Batten, is, is comprising one of the only very few surviving accounts of the women who physically wove this software for the Apollo missions during the 1960s. So by threading wires around and through these donut-shaped magnetic cores, they created a form of information storage known as core memory. Throughout the first two decades of the Cold War, core memory was the principal mechanism by which computers were storing and retrieving information. So in the case of the core memory, the core rope memory behind me, passing a wire through the core creates a one, bypassing that core creates a zero. The design of the Apollo guidance computer began in, in 1961 at a time when these room-sized machines running on punch cards were dominating the computer industry. So that equipment was essentially too heavy, too large to fit in the cone of a rocket, and the Apollo missions needed a kind of onboard guidance system that could direct the spacecraft from Earth, right, independent of mission control stations. So in essence, they were looking for one of the world's first portable computers. Although astronauts wouldn't touch the, the, Earth's, the moon surface until uh, Apollo 11, each of these Apollo missions had to leave Earth's atmosphere and travel these extraordinary lengths with living humans on board. So core rope memory had to fit those temporal and spatial constraints uh, that kind of storage environment it described, right, it's extreme cold, intense vibration. But it also had to respond to the limited resources of electricity and of weight load. So it had to minimize the number of circuits assembled, the number of components required, and pack them as tightly as possible, as a science reporter at MIT described. So most of what was known today about Apollo 8, that first sort of, quote, manned mission to the moon and back, derives from these stories that were told about the American male engineers like managers Richard Batten, um, who was audible on the moon machines account. But here I'm asking with you today, what can we learn about their contributions now? To begin exploring these questions, our team looked at the broader question of core memory plane development, which is formed alongside 
and informed the core rope memory, but involved even smaller weaving instruments like the microscopes you see here. So while collecting initial archival material in the process, I came across a small number of these 1960s P2P eight core memory planes for sale online, and I ordered them. And in my hands, these planes, kind of square and compact, kind of reminded me of the size and shape of other forms of memory production, in particular, the quilt blocks, a kind of complementary form of feminized work. So in the coming months, we assemble this interdisciplinary team at the University of Washington to develop this collaborative quilt made up of the core memory planes. The patches would materialize the work of the core memory weavers and as well as invite sort of new points of encounter. During a series of participatory workshops, we then invite groups of historians of technology, design educators, and members of the public visiting a maker summit to assemble what we call these patch kits. And the kits comprised a simple board loom, strings, and beads in place of those ferrite cores and wires. And each kit then, as assembled, became the quilt square. So when people completed their core memory kits and plugged them into the electronic quilt, they triggered that quilt to play the first-hand accounts of 1960s core memory production. One quilt, for example, played a clip of Ed Blodden of AC Sparkplug, accompanied with um, the description, the female operators were good at it, he said, and those that stood around telling them what to do were terrible at it. The quilt would also send tweets via our LOL Weavers account. So each tweet would hold 140 characters, which is roughly reflected in the number of bytes held in the 1960s core memory planes. A key event during this process was meeting Helen Remick, an extraordinary woman who's a, a master quilter working herself with obsolescent technology. So her work involved anything from film strips, her family photos to CDs that capture digital files and even small slide decks. There's more on Helen in our paper. Now together, the, the four of us, Remick, Shore, Kraft, and I would uh, work through several versions of these patches, picking up patents, wondering how the beads might have been oriented before and during assembly, using our grasp of the material to start asking questions of the core memory engineers that we were even in contact with. We worked at scales that were equivalent to only a few millimeters of weaving on the original 1960s planes. And we would exploit this quality as we designed the quilt itself. So following a visual quilting trope that Helen sometimes used in her own patchwork, we repeated patterns at three different scales, each embodied by the three different core memory planes. So one, the original 1960s planes, uh, another, uh, yet to be assembled, and a third woven by Remick. Designing these patches involved more than simply organizing a sturdy material for our quilt. It really meant learning what tools and, and processes the weavers had, had engaged and what techniques were applied. So at, at one meeting, not the 2017 software studies command lines, this project represented a kind of standard topic for attendees, historians of technology. But that was only until our patch kits came out. We're really gonna do this? An older gentleman in the front row had asked. We actually later learned he was in fact serving as an engineer on one of the original Apollo missions. This question as to whether he would actually do the work of weaving, exposed a kind of separation of practice in this conference setting, a place where we expected to watch, listen, and learn from a sort of distance, reinforced by the, even the camera in the room and a podium at the front. But here we chose this technique of inviting us to present and pick up materials, a kind of plastic bead, yarn, card cardboard loom. Um, this confusion of materials kind of continued as participants were picking up the patch kits. The first step read, thread a needle and string four beads onto the thread. One gentleman kind of struggled to pass 
his needle through the large plastic beads that were more than 10 times the size of the 1960s ferrite cores, and at one point became so flustered, he dropped all the beads, the kit, onto the floor, leading us to hunt for spare parts. Others encountered tangled yarn, misplaced knots, tiny round beads constantly flowing away. And midway through, of course, one man explained to the woman sitting next to him, I'm literally on step one. I spent most of the time putting those beads back on the string, and that's where I'm at. Others moved through the instructions kind of with ease or later to recognize that they'd skipped a bead and had to then start their patch over again. It's humbling, one person said. Yet at the back of the room sat a row of attendees who had built their squares with amazing precision and craftsmanship. A museum curator who finished beautifully squared, uh, sort of crafted uh, planes with perfectly faced beads. And that relative ease or discomfort of weaving provided a small insight into the ways certain types of skills became naturalized in these sewing or in scientific fields. So after an hour of focused work, attendees placed their patches on the snaps of the core memory quilt alongside actual pieces of core memory. And at each installation, audio began to play. The voice of Richard Batten again played and then quickly interrupted by another snapping in place. It's an extremely time consuming process, said Don Isles, a software engineer at MIT. So these participants gathered around, kind of hearing bits of media unlocked by the quilt, almost as if the quilt became a musical instrument. Plugging in the patches also triggered these tweets on the LOL Weaver's account, and those corresponding quotes kind of felt automated or bot-like. They were kind of all in the same format, not directed at anyone in particular, and with cell phones in hand, people began to recontextualize those tweets using the quoted reply feature on Twitter, saying things like, these tweets, they're coming from the quilt, they're generating these reverberations of the work beyond the immediate confines of the event. Soon the conversation turned to the language that we use to describe this process of making core memory. Someone asked how these, the weavers were described at the time. Hoping to shed more light on this, I reached out to Frederick Dill, who is a pioneering engineer and co-inventor of the semiconductor laser, who I'd been in contact with during the project. Dill had recently sent me this 1957 volume of digital computer components and circuits, with a typed and printed note said, until this discussion, I'd never heard of stringing cores as a weaving problem, but it is certainly a good view. When I asked what he meant by this comment, he later told me via email, you have focused on the threads or wires where I focused on the cores. Your focus on weaving as an equally valid viewpoint, but a different one, sort of assumes that some particular configuration of weaving will produce what is needed, which is totally correct. So by attending the weaving rather than electric, the electrical cores, Dill and others began to see these different stories of contingency and embodied practice, sort of identifying the weave structure as a pivotal innovation, right? As he said, the mechanism that will produce what is needed. This insight was unusual, not only due to its widespread omission from the core memory literature, but to its deeper recognition of women's embodied practice, or bodies even at all, as core contributors, right, to engineering. So as Remick reminded us one afternoon, quilting isn't just handwork, it's back work, it's network, it's knee work. While both building and engaging the quilts, our observations started to counter most public narratives given of the core memory weaver's work. So in the, in the uh, MIT museum footage introducing a Paul and Guidance computer, the interviewing journalist observes that a woman passes the wire back and forth and she, he says, doesn't need to think about which cores goes through next. No, says Jack Ponestone, who's the Raytheon manager. Um, the machine does that for her, right? These accounts presented the weavers as unthinking, unskilled laborers, perceptions that simply couldn't be held after we experienced this precision process ourselves. From our quilts, we began to see what Lisa Nakamura cautions against when peering inside the machine, not those dancing, bunny-suited, clean room workers happily making chips for free. Instead, she suggests looking inside digital culture means both looking back in time to the roots of computing industry and the specific material production practices that positioned race and gender as commodities in electronic factories. So in closing, a few themes that we can reflect on as a community in HCI. For 
see, for making fabrication and even creative production broadly, this work is, is pointing us to looking beyond the behavior of systems and toward those invisible bodies that, that make, engage, and maintain them. Sort of our concern for handwork is expanding and deepening this long-standing historical focus on code programmers like the famous Margaret Hamilton, Grace Hopper, even the, the women of ENIAC, and accounting for those acts of, of creating the machine and not the least the role of the women's body in doing so. And the core memory of quilt further drew attention to these fears of kind of human error, how those fears were associated with these gendered forms of production. The weaver's process took almost eight weeks of work to produce, but it could take days to redo just one line of code. This was just work unfathomable to us as we got our hair caught in the yarn and as our bodies were kind of hunched over these, these core memory kits. And lastly, our work is pushing HCI in, in a way to partner with historians, other cultural critics, in materializing the absences and sort of revisiting the design and engineering practices that, that systematically disappear, but yet still haunt our present. In this sort of designing with ghosts and HCI, we might actually be forging new alliances between archival resources and design techniques, some interesting ways. So doing this project meant facing the fact that maybe every woman who could tell this story is now gone. And while their accounts of engineers and, and astronauts are kind of canonized through our achievements, we might never know the experience of the little old ladies. Because we neglected to tell, collect their stories in the past, we can fail to know them in the present. So reviving their accounts informs our, our contemporary understanding of what innovation looks like and in turn shapes possibilities for building technology differently now. So our project acts as a kind of powerful case for challenging these, these histories that not only reassert divisions between cognitive and manual labor, but also this sort of hide the locales, the practices and bodies rarely associated with innovation work. Here we learn that what it means to be innovated is deeply connected to what it means to be free and empowered. So in closing, I'd like to just quote Vincent Dupré, who talks about this, the, this process to create stories, to make history, is, not, is to reconstruct, to fabulate in a way that opens other possibilities for the past, in the present, and the future. And a, a related book out in a few weeks, a plug shamelessly, and thanks so much to our many collaborators on this project who made it possible and continue to be working with us today. Thanks Thank so much. You. Okay, so um, we'll take one question. Thanks, Daniela. Um, I, I'm going to ask two questions if I can, but they're maybe short. One is an empirical question, and it, it could be that the invisibility makes this impossible to answer, but mm -hmm. how did women come into this work? Like, what, mm -hmm. was there a, a standard trajectory that brought them into the core weaving work? And then the other analytic question is simply for people who want to understand this, this moment, this practice, historical practice, sociological practice, what is, the, what is the act of physically doing it add to the analysis? What, you can, what can you understand from the actual weaving practice that you couldn't get from stories, histories, narratives, etc. Yeah. So the first question. These are great questions. So the first, um, it's it's actually really interesting how difficult it is to get to the bottom of that question. So there are actually a lot of different um, accounts of of where the the women for the Apollo mission in particular came from. Um, Initially, we had read that we had sort of assumed, based on some of the popular accounts, that it was actually from textile industries that were kind of closing down in the area in Massachusetts. This is in Waltham, um, but in fact, at this point, we're, we're we're fairly sure it was a watch factory that that actually had closed down nearby, um, and that the the assemblers of the watch factory were were skilled at this precision work. 
Um, and in the second case, I mean, that's sort of underlying a much of this project, right? This question of what can you know by, by doing, by making and doing, essentially. And, you know, there's no simple answer to that, but, but for us, and this is, this is sort of through now, um, not only the workshops that I described today, but a series of classroom experiences and now a set of pedagogical toolkits that we're assembling, we're finding that these these ways of making and doing together are actually invitations for us to share our own stories. And this kind of invitation of, of storytelling through both the, the acts of, of, of um, kind of historical making that we're, that we're narrating literally by telling the stories out loud and the, the kind of stories that people are bringing to the workshop themselves, either by the fact that they've they've done similar work in the past, or that they have stories to tell that have been absented, that these are moments, kind of invitations that we haven't experienced through interviews, that we haven't experienced through, through kind of other encounters in the field, through observation, for example. But even more to your point, there are literally parts of the core memory itself we didn't understand until doing this. So the sense line is, a, is the line that was able to actually pick up where um, you know, the zeros and ones were landing. And that sense line, we, we only figured out through making a re, a re sort of uh, presencing that work that, that essentially that was the line that couldn't be automated. There was no way to make sure that that sense line was, was um, strung by a machine because it, it just required a kind of orthogonal work that had to be um, assembled, at least at that point in time, by hand. And um, we found no accounts of that, that particular point, but it, w it, w it allowed us to understand a bit about the historical tra trajectory. So what happened is automation occurred in factories up until the mid 60s and we saw an IBM actually have piecemeal work. So when they started to, um, to hand off a series of core memory planes to people at homes and then those, those folks would, would do it with the assembly, right, domestically and then send off their, their planes to others. So much larger discussion, but essentially there were actually pizza, pieces of gaps, right, that we were able to kind of sort through through the making of these ourselves. Thank you, thank you. Um, and with that, this paper was the best paper, so we want to congratulate this paper.